After being in combat in the snow, and I was wounded when there were mortar shells coming down on us, then I was in the hospital in Liège, Belgium for a while. Then I was put on limited duty out of the infantry, and I had men guarding trains. And uh, when the war ended, as I mentioned, I was on the borderline between France and Belgium. Uh, then time went on. Um, they needed somebody to further Franco-American relations. They sent me to the University of Grenoble. I was the only one in my battalion who had gone to college, and so they picked me. And I went down to Grenoble for six weeks and studied that. The Germans would retreat and they would mark wherever they were. And we, we were in the snow going over these coal slags, which from coal mines was the leftover. And uh, they had it all zeroed in. And as we were going over there, they, they, uh, they used mortars and a bunch of mortar shells just then came over and exploded all around us. And the shrapnel is what hit, hit me and hit us in various parts of body at that time. And then uh, after that, uh, I was taken to a hospital in Liège, Belgium. And then I was put on, at first I couldn't talk for about a day or so. Then uh, I was there in the hospital a while, and then I was put on limited duty with the, uh, as I mentioned, with these men who we'd send on ca carrying supplies on freight trains to the front. They were called MPs, but really it was not the normal MP duty. Then uh, the months passed and I was in France and Belgium when the war ended. Then we go back, one thing that happened later in, it was Christmas of 1945. We had 200 men, uh, Floyd Anderson, Captain and myself in Reims, Belgium which was the heart of the Champagne region in France. And Eisenhower had signed the peace agreement there in May. And we were up there and it was Christmas time and we got our men to donate their candy rations. And so Anderson and I took our candy rations to a little school French kids were and we gave them the candies, which then the mayor was so excited. It was a small village that he gave us, Anderson and I, a can of wine before they fermented into champagne. He gave us that case of wine. So there it was Christmas Eve. Andy and I we were in this little little house that was just for us, it was snowing outside, and we both started drinking. And so we drank away, and I guess after we drank about three or four bottles of wine, we were pretty drunk. So we started wrestling, and he's, he was about six foot two, I was five foot six. We started wrestling, and of all things, uh, the, there was marble floor. Um, somehow, boom, I knocked Andy over and he broke his leg. He broke his leg right there. We were alone in this place, out in the country, in the snow. And uh, so we finally took care of him. 
the meantime, a few days later, I got my orders that I was being sent back to the U.S. I was being, I had enough points to go, but Andy, Andy was left with the 200 men. And they were going into Germany, to Nuremberg, to the Army of Occupation. So the scene was, there we were, there were these big trailer, semi-trailer trucks with 200 men in these trucks with their belongings. And Andy was sitting in front in a Jeep with his leg straight up like that in a brace. And I was saying goodbye to him because I was going to leave. He shook my hand and he said, you little SOB leaving me alone. And so there it was. I left him and I was going back to La Havre to go back to the U.S. So that was a funny scene. Finally, I met him several years later. He worked at DuPont Company in Wilmington, Delaware. He was a little older than I. Anyway, uh, when I got to La Havre, I was uh, being processed to go back to the United States to be discharged from the Army then. But it just so happened that they had had in France, in Paris, a major in the finance corps who was in charge of all the finances in the European command. He had like a bank where he took care of all the money that was dispersed out to anybody who came into the country in Paris. And he was court-martialed because they checked the amount of money and there was a shortage in the money that he had. Well, they had to wait for a replacement captain to come over from the United States, take his place. My luck was, as I was being there, they noticed that I had been studying finance and administration at college. So they pulled me aside and they sent me back to fill in temporarily in Paris, for which lasted for a period of three months to take over his duties. And there I was, and I knew nothing about what it was all about. And there were about 60 people working for me in these offices. It was like a bank, right near the George Sank Hotel, Prince of Wales, on um, right there near the Champs-Élysées and the Arc de Triomphe. This bank that we had, I had CPAs working there. There were wax women, people, civilians. It was like a bank. Anybody who had come to Paris, to France, would have to change their currencies to francs, French francs. And I had about 50 currencies, a total of about $5 million. And then there were bank windows and there were little metal boxes where the money was kept. And at the end of the day, they would give me the keys, the people who worked there, to it. And they were also issuing treasury checks to farmers, French farmers, whose cows had been killed during the war and all that sort of thing. So I was quite active. All I knew was on Friday night, everybody would give me a tally of how much money was in their individual boxes. And they'd prepare it because two colonels would come down, see if I had the five million dollars in there. I wanted to make sure of that. And uh, so they'd come down, they would sign off, and then they'd ask me, well, how do you know how do we know that the money is really there? I'd say, well, you know, I've got it from all these people. And they surely weren't going to count the money on a Friday afternoon. So that was my stint there in Paris in the finance office. 
While I was in Paris, I, I did get married. I married a Polish girl there. She couldn't speak English, I couldn't speak Polish, but somehow we managed. And then I was discharged, went back to the United States. And in New York, there was a requirement that the, any employer you had before had to take you to work. So I went back to the accounting company that I'd worked at while I was at college. And I also finished college there. That was in 1946 and 1947. And while I worked with them, I learned a great deal because I had 30 clients, all of my own, collecting the money from clients that had everything from artificial flowers to modeling places, belts they manufactured, compacts for ladies. So I learned a lot about business and things. And then uh, my uh, wife at the time didn't like the New York. She was afraid of atomic bombs. And so I moved to Massachusetts, got off the bus in Massachusetts and worked there in a mill, in a textile mill for about two years. My son was born on one of the trips back to New York. Then my daughter was born up there in Clinton, Massachusetts. Daughter Laurie and son Arthur. And I was pretty aggressive. I went there as the assistant office manager. And I got to learn everything about the factory. They were making ladies' pajamas. And so I got the idea of maybe they should make pajamas for girls because the population, I looked at the census, was growing children. So they said, well, if you do it, we'll let you do it. So I created a division for girls' pajamas, hired salesmen through newspaper ads. They carried other lines, and we went along well there. And I was always looking to get ahead. I was very aggressive. And the next thing I knew, um, after being in Massachusetts, they brought me back to New York for a while because they wanted me to be in the head office. I did that, went back to Massachusetts, and finally I left there completely, and I got a job in Pennsylvania, in Altoona, Pennsylvania, in 1954, with a huge sweater, men's sweater, shirt, men's shirt, manufacturing called Puritan Sportswear. They were a big company, about 3,000 people. They were the biggest, and the second biggest employer in Altoona, Mass Pennsylvania, which was the hub of the Pennsylvania Railroad. Because when they were building the railroads out to Chicago, they stopped there to repair and put on a car in the rear because it had to go over the train had to go over the Allegheny Mountains. And that's where I worked, in the middle of where there were coal mines and steel mills a little further away towards Pittsburgh. I learned a lot there. I handled, I became the controller, one of the top executives in the country. And so that was pretty much what I did. It was not a happy time of my life. I worked hard there, and uh, I won't get into all the personal things of my life that happened then. To go back to Massachusetts, uh, it was August 1948, I had to take an overnight train from New York to get there. And I got there off on a Sunday in a little town of 12,000 people. Clinton, Massachusetts. I got off the bus, nobody was around, and I had a room in an attic in this old lady's house. 
And that's where I was. I started working in that mill there. And the town was very ugly, as I said. It wasn't very pleasant. And my son got pneumonia there. And my daughter Laurie was born there. And after I learned everything, they wanted to send me to New York, which I did. And I took over the children's part of the pajamas. And all by myself, running ads in newspapers. I never saw the salesman, but they'd have different lines. And I got them to carry our line, shipped them the samples, and within one year, I had gotten to do $1 million in sales, which was terrific for them, for the company. And that's when the boss put me on profit sharing of that uh, factory. It wasn't too much profit because he was an older man. And so it was there. But then I decided to move on. I went to Altoona, Pennsylvania at a huge increase in salary. In 1954, I, I got $12,000 a year salary. Then I was able to buy a house very nice house there, $14,000 with $500 down. So we were saving money like crazy. And it was very hard work. It was the first time that I had used computers. Computers were then punch card systems. I went to IBM school and, and I, we worked six days a week, very hard. It was difficult. And then I also joined the community theater. And I thought to myself, you don't want to be doing this the rest of your life, Joe. And I thought, I would like to become a professor at college. And that way, that would keep me young. And I'd be with young people all my life instead of being 65 and having worked in a big factory. So at night, I'd travel by car three times a week to another town, Johnstown, Pennsylvania, in the snow or whenever, to study at Indiana State Teachers College to become a professor. So I did that for a while. Uh, our family life was good with the children. I devoted myself with children. My wife and I did not get along well at all. At times she left and I was there with the children. Um, finally, she developed uh, a type of hay fever. There was a lot of ragweed there that would go into uh, asthma. And so it was thought, boy, we have to move out of here. So I took two weeks vacation and I ran ads in newspapers in Los Angeles and San Francisco. I came out to Los Angeles and I, I got answers to my ads and I found a couple of jobs in Los Angeles right away. But the jobs were for a portion of what I was making back in Pennsylvania. Because I could have, believe it or not, had I stood in Pennsylvania, made enough money at that time to retire in about seven more years. But that never happened. The happiest day of my life is when I got on the train leaving Altoona, Pennsylvania, to go to Pittsburgh to catch a plane that would go out to Chicago and then to Los Angeles. Uh, Altoona was not a very pleasant place to be. If it, and I had very bad memories there, exceedingly bad. But I learned so much there. 
So Tell me what, what, what didn't you like about the city? Why didn't you like the city? Well, the city was very ugly from all the coal dust that had come from the coal mines and the Pennsylvania Railroad was right in the center of the town. The train stopped right in the middle of the town of Altoona with everything else that was there. It was, it was not a very enticing place. Even though I joined the community theater to keep myself going, because I liked acting somehow, and I was doing that there, amateur basis. It gave me some joy, and of course, being with the, my children was everything at their age. Um, I had, we had three children at that age. The night of January 16th and some other plays, I can't remember the names, but you know, we rehearsed and did the for the, for the community. But it was some fun, you know. Anyway, I got on the plane and, and went to Los Angeles, and I found two jobs there pretty quick. I had a lot of time on my hands. I thought, well, they, they were going to pay me about 60% of what I was making. Somebody said, hey, I taken two weeks vacation. Maybe you ought to go down to San Diego. It's really a nice place. That's what I did. So I went down to San Diego. I fell in love with San Diego. Beautiful town. 1960, and so I, I went to uh, agencies there. They had nothing in my field. They said they had something that was not in my field at all, and I couldn't do it. But I talked them in. It was in television, in a local television station. But I talked them into letting me go out there and interview for it. Well. To make it short, I got the job there as assistant to the manager, I called controller of a station, Channel 10, in San Diego. And boy, everybody said television would be hard work, but it was a cinch compared to what I did there. And as time went by, there were about 120 people there. I loved. The manager left, and I became the manager. And at that time, I had Regis Philbin worked for me as one of my newsmen, and Raquel Welch became my weather girl during my stint there. And I managed the station, and it was purchased then by Time Life Broadcast, which was a big, big company of Time Life magazine, and they were very waspy, and I, being a Jew, was somewhat out of place because most of them had gone to Princeton and Dartmouth, and they had their own people, but they had to accept me because by then I was pretty well known in San Diego. I belonged to the Rotary Club, the Exchange Club, and knew all the people there. So they offered me jobs in New York. I wouldn't go. Um, so I was there in San Diego, and that's where I stood for five years. Then Time Life decided that they would expand into South America. So they came to me one time and asked me if I would go to Venezuela and work there for them. And I didn't like the idea. I said, no, I love it here. And I was making a lot of headway in San Diego, so much so that with another man, we almost started a cable system there. With five guys, we built the San Diego Sports Stadium and we we got the National Hockey League there, and this was in addition to my work there. Well, t 
Time went on, and they offered me a job in Brazil, to go down to Brazil. And I said, no, I didn't want to go back down to Brazil. But then I studied it, and they, I decided, well, okay, I'll go there for one year. But after that one year, I want to come back to my job because they had sent two of their men from New York who could not adjust to the Brazilian partner. They didn't have the, the samba or the way of acting and being. And so the Brazilian partner didn't like them. And so I said, okay, I'd go. And so I... I went down there, and when I got there, I thought, gee, these people are great. You know, they're very friendly, easygoing, unlike what we had to do at the station in San Diego. Well, the Time Life guys, as I said, were waspy guys, and they, uh, they most of them, they come in in the morning, and they'd go out for lunch and have two martinis each. So I had to catch them in the morning in order to make sense because when they came back from lunch, they were really high as a kite. And there wasn't much, much business you could do. And they were in the rock, they were in the uh, Time Life building in New York, which was on Avenue of America's 51st Street. And so that, that was that part of it, you know. And at the station where I worked, the TV station, also the guys, everything was very square. And there was a cameraman who worked for us. His name was Art Farian. And he was of Armenian, very friendly guy. And he would come in and chat with me. And I'd chat and I liked him. Well, the guys who were the executives with me, the engineer and the other guys, they say, Joe, he's, he's, not a, he's not a very good guy for you to talk with. You know, he's not exactly straight as, as these guys were very serious. But when I got to Brazil, I found that all the people were like this guy, Art Farian. So I really felt great there. Anyway, I got, I went down there with, with two of the guys from Time Life who brought me down to meet the partner. And of course I didn't speak a word of Portuguese. And, the, and uh, so I met, I met the partner and he had a translator, and and then they, we had a temporarily a Cuban man, Alberto Cata, who spoke Portuguese, but he was not doing too well. He wasn't feeling well. And so I was going to work with him until he would leave and go back to the States. So anyway, there I was, and um, I started, um, and there was a man in charge who was a Brazilian guy and who had worked for them for ra in radio for the Brazilian partner. Um, so um, Brazil was a funny country then. It only had about 70 million people, and most of the country was settled on the coast of Brazil. Very few people lived in the interior of the country. And they had a lot of mixed nationalities from Polish, German, Italian, so on. People who had come there in the 1800s. And not only that, very poor communication, telephone, there was about one telephone for every 30 people who lived in the country. And so when we had television station, 
And to use a telephone was a big thing. We had to have telephone boys who would sit with two telephones at their ears waiting to get a buzz sound. And then they'd say, linea, which was line. And boy, then you'd get on a line and you'd start talking to the person and the line would flop. And the only other way to get to see the person who we were talking to downtown was to grab one of these Volkswagen taxi cabs and go down and try to go up a 15-story building and maybe get stuck in the elevator on your way up. So that's what it was like to do business in Brazil. It was, it was tough, but, but very challenging, very interesting. So when I got there, they, the station went on the air in April. I got there in August of 1965. There were 700 employees at the station. It was just Rio de Janeiro, of which 70 of them were in the symphony orchestra, of all things. They had actors who had never who were contracted, who hadn't been paid, and most of the programming was purchased from overseas. So it was, it was quite difficult, and the station was in fourth place, and we were losing about $250,000 a month. So I started that way, and it was, it was, uh, little difficult. I studied the language with a dictionary, learning grammar. I'd study at night, talk. There were very few who spoke English, and it took me about six months to become pretty fluent in Portuguese. I loved, I loved the place. The culture was so different than anything I'd ever known. The people are very docile people, in spite, they, if two people disagree, they walk away from each other. They don't fight as much. Anyway, so what happened there when I, um, the place was very disorganized. They, they had no budgets. They didn't know what they were spending. They put the programs on the air. The main thing was, They'd re everything, by the way, television was live. There was no videotape or anything like that. So what we do is they would rehearse the shows in the afternoon and then go on the air at night. And so it was, it was uh, not an easy. And Sunday mornings, they played symphony orchestra. And of course, they were playing some American programs, and some of them were like the Beverly Hillbillies, which they put on nine o'clock at night, dubbed into Portuguese, which, you know, didn't work. And so our station of the four stations in Rio was in last place. So when I got there, I saw these contracts with CBS and American firms and I canceled a lot of them. I said, hey, we can't, and some of them we had already run, and we were running out of money. And I said, well, you know, I, we can't pay you. We'll have to pay it off over a few years. So that created big problems. But I, I succeeded in doing that. Finally, I looked at the other, we had a station also in Sao Paulo, which had been purchased before I got there, and nobody from our group had ever been there. So unbeknown to anybody else, I went there to Sao Paulo, which was the big city. Bear in mind that Brazil at that time only had three million television homes and there were 70 million 
people living in the country. So I went to Sao Paulo and I looked at that station. It was a mess. They, they, their, their, their coverage of the city was very poor. So people couldn't even get to see the station. And not only that, half the people were being paid who weren't even reporting to work. So it was, it was a, a real mess. And I went back, and at first I was going to suggest to Time Life that they pull out of Brazil. I thought it wouldn't work. But then while I, while I was in Sao Paulo, I was looking for a salesperson to sell our time in Sao Paulo, which was a big market. And there I met a guy who was from our leading competitor, TV Rio. The name of our network, of our station, was TV Globo, G-L-O-B-O. -O. So um, he suggested he said, yeah, I'll come to work for you if you hire another guy who works at my station in Rio. Well, sure enough, their station in Rio was the number one station. So I hired away their top people from that station to our station, telling them that I was time life and so on. And of course, the language barrier was quite difficult in getting them interested, but they liked me. And these were young guys. I was 42, and their average age was 27. They had worked in radio before, and they were young guys. And the owner, the owner of the television station had a general manager. His name was Rubens Amaral. He was he'd worked with the owner. The owner, the owner of the station, also owned radio station, and he had the newspaper. It was the second large circulate. I shouldn't say second. Maybe it was the fifth, because in Rio, believe it or not, they had eleven newspapers that ran every day. So anyway. When I got these two people from our major competitor, who was number one, these youngsters, and I talked to them, and they expressed interest in coming to work for me, to work for us, not me. So I said, well, I, I said, I'll, I'll, talk to, I'll talk to the boss and see if I can have you meet him. But when I went to the Brazilian boss, whose name was Roberto Marinho, and he was about in his 60s, and I told him the name of the guy who I was trying to get, whose name happened to be Walter Clark Bueno, who was Brazilian. His grandfather was an admiral. And when I told him that name, the Brazilian owner looked at me and he says, you got him? He said, how did you find him? I said, well, I found him, but he'll come only if this other man will come. So I arranged a meeting at the owner's home, at Roberto Marino's home. And I, I brought these two guys over to meet him. And of course, he was, when they left, he was so impressed. He said, I don't know how you found them, but see what you can do to get them. So what I did is I, through circumstances, developed a flu. I had a bad case of the flu. And finally I had them come up to my little apartment in Copacabana and I convinced them to come to work for us with a very small salary because we didn't have much money. And for 1% of the sales to the guy 
who I, I really wanted, Walter Clark. So the scene was the following. Unbeknown to the general manager, the owner came up to my little apartment with these two men and his, his secretary, who was the interpreter, and his interpreter typed the contract on an old typewriter, the contract for these two guys to come to work for us. And that was the beginning, because I had hired away the best people from the leading competitor in Rio. So then I had to go back to the States for 10 days because my daughter in San Diego had gotten in a, an accident and had concussion of her brain. So I had to go back there and then return. I was in Brazil alone. My family was still in San Diego. And so that's, that's how we started together, working with this. Then Walter Clark brought in other people who were from other stations to work with us, and we started to organize the station. And I put them on a budget, and I wrote to Time Life, and I said, if you will give us $250,000 until we reach next June of 66, I'll be able to break even. I thought I'd be able to have the stations break even. Well, that never happened. It took us five years to break even. And that began our story of working with the, with the guys I had there on the station. We started to produce some of our own programs, telenovelas, and we had a big flood in Rio, flooded the station, and people were stuck in the hills. People lived in mud houses on the hills, were stuck and they had to come down. And we put our cameras out on the patio showing these poor people. And we, because of this intelligence of our manager, our new manager, we got first place in Rio. So in 1966, Rio was in first place. We were doing well. But Sao Paulo, we, we had no audience at all. We were in bad shape. And then came 1967. 1967 was the worst year of our existence. We almost went under in that year for several reasons. First of all, Time Life's money that they were sending in had ended in 1966, and we had no more money to cover our deficit, which we had. In 1967, January, there was a huge rainstorm in Rio. The rainstorm was so bad that it flooded the electric generating capacity of the electricity company in Rio, which was owned by a Canadian company, so that electricity was only available to one-third of the population in Rio. And that went on for three months. So you can imagine trying to play television when you didn't have people who could see you. And that's what we did. And the light company also had to ration electricity because people didn't have electricity. And the way they rationed it was one area would have lights, electricity, let's say, from uh, 
three o'clock to six o'clock in the afternoon. And then it would go dark. Another one would have not from six to nine. Another one from nine to midnight. And so they published different times when you knew that there was electricity. So the poor people had to run and the Rio was all 12 story buildings, 12, 15 story buildings with elevators. So people in order not to be stuck in the elevators and not to uh, be, not to be able to get to their homes had to rush up and down during the hours to get lights and stores were only open at certain times. Well, so you can see the situation for three months was quite chaotic. Not only that, the worst thing was that the light company did not stick to their schedules. And this created havoc. People didn't know they were stuck in elevators for a couple of hours. It happened to me where I lived, where I was stuck between floors for an hour waiting for an elevator to move. So these things made it impossible for us as a television station to reach the public and there was no income coming in. Secondly, in addition to that, the Sao Paulo station didn't have any audience and we had a staff there. And the people went on strike there. They said, if we couldn't get paid, we can continue. So we had strikes, no income coming in, and we were close to going out of business. When we finally reached out to a local bank, a local bank called Banco Nacional de Minas Gerais, and our friend Jose Magalhães Pinto. We went to him with Dr. Mourinho, I, and our manager, Walter Clark, and he agreed to lend us what was then a lot of money in cruzeros, which was 400 million cruzeros. Bear in mind that inflation in Brazil at that time was going at about 100% a year. So the only way to get your money when you had dollars was to put it in overnight where you would get interest, then oh, overnight you would invest your money again to save you from inflation. So that's what occurred to us in 1967, where that bank loaned us that money and another bank, which was, became Banco Itaú today, which was then called another name, they loaned us some money. And those two banks saved us from going under. The other thing to remember is Brazil was under a military dictatorship. The military dictatorship started in 1967 and it continued through 1985. And the military dictatorship caused us a great deal of grief. The grief being that we had to have all our scripts of programming sent to Brasilia to be censored and to be cut out of things the military did not like because many of our telenovelas involved social issues 
people. And our writers were largely people who were left-leaning. Our chief writer was a communist, of course, but he was not a known communist because the communists were being put in jail and persecuted by the military. So much so that some of our news people disappeared and went to jail. And we didn't know where they was, were or how to find them. So this went on during these years. Particularly 1968 was a terrible year of the military dictatorship. And of course, we were arguing with them of putting certain programs on the air. And they would say, well, we're going to take you off the air if you do that. And we at that time had a nice audience. And we'd say, well, if you take us off the air, what will the people do? The people will uprise against the military government. So there was a constant balance and a fight between our owner, who was dealing with the military government and our station. So that went on during these years of 1967 and 1968, when things were pretty bad. The reporters were arrested and we didn't know where they were. And the, the military also had a secret service that at times, even when the military agreed to free somebody, they had trouble finding them. So um, some of them were tortured somewhat, and many of them were returned to us, and some of them were no longer able to work for us. That's what went on there. My feelings were very difficult. My work was extremely difficult. First of all, with these young men who I was working with. They were interested in putting the shows on the air, no matter what it took. And I was trying to tell them that we had to have, we had only a certain amount of money and we could only do so much. And the idea of budgets, I tried to establish budgets with them including my manager. And he would say, Joe, please don't talk to me about that. They, they refused to put in budgets, which I tried to get in each department. And so that made the situation terrible. Each day was like a boxing match, doing, working. We'd get in, and we would argue a great deal. Our production, chief of production, who is an excellent man, Jose Bonifacio de Oliveira, he would put on his jacket and go home. He wouldn't want to work. It was very difficult to get, for me, to get things going, so much so that later, later, I threatened to leave because I could not take it until they agreed to do what I wanted them to do. The people I had to manage initially were the people who worked under me who were only about 10 people. But, as I will explain later, that grew as we expanded. For me, it was because, first of all, I was a foreigner, and they accepting a foreigner to tell them what to do 
was not something that I did. I had to play according to their music. I danced to the way they danced and the way they looked at things, which was different than the way I was trained. So I had to slowly get them over a period of years to get them to adopt certain ways of a modern network, which we built over the years. But it was, that was the difficult job. I was, as you might, as they often refer to me, as the glue between the crystals to keep them from falling apart because they would argue with each other as well. And I would try to be a moderator to keep the production and sales department from really, they were at logger, loggerheads with each other all the time. At one time in 1967, I had a minor nervous breakdown where I had to go away for a period of two weeks and to rest up because I couldn't take the amount of fighting and arguing that was going on. That was in 1968, 1967 and 1968. Finally, in 1969 was a year that changed a lot for us. We <clears throat> were struggling and the dictatorship continued. I was sitting in my apartment in Rio on a Sunday night when I received a call that our station was on fire and burning and the firemen in Sao Paulo were trying to cope with it. So I, get, I gathered my manager and another two men and the only way we could get there was to drive. It was a Sunday evening that this happened. The program that had ended at six o'clock at night and the fire started about 7 p.m. When the fire occurred, it was about, as we got in, we got into my car. I had an old Mercedes car, uh, which was a 1964 Mercedes. And we got into my car to drive to Sao Paulo. And the roads were not very good. These were the two main cities. We drove at night in my car, four of us, and our luck was that halfway on the road to Sao Paulo, the car broke down and we couldn't continue. So we waited somehow and we were able to catch a bus that was going through. We got on this bus. We didn't get into Sao Paulo until the next morning. When we got there the next morning, our lead production man had been working in Sao Paulo, producing a novella in one of the buildings that was burnt to the ground. When we got there in the morning, about eight o'clock in the morning, after a 12 hour trip, uh, the station was burnt to the ground. And uh, there we were. Uh, at, at the same time, our transmitter, which was about eight miles from the city of Sao Paulo, eight or 12 miles, was under machine gun fire by the revolutionaries 
who were against the military dictatorship. There was a large revolutionary group who was trying to knock out our transmitter, but they couldn't do so because you had to take a funicular car to get up to the mountain where our transmitter was. So thank goodness our transmitter was saved, which meant that we were able to provide some programming to the people of Sao Paulo in the ashes of the building that we had. We had to put cameras and other things there. Um, so that fire cost us a great deal because we were stuck. We, we, uh, Sao Paulo is the biggest market in Brazil, and we didn't have a station there. The thing we did was we, we first tried, we went around to look for other studios that existed. The next day, one of our competitors' studios burnt to the ground as well. We had asked them if they would let us use one of theirs. Well, they were gone the next day. So we looked at movie studios. The cinema industry was very pioneering in Brazil, not much doing. And there was one that was not good called Maria Stella. And so the the two men who I had, my two chief men, the manager and his assistant, they said, well, we've got to put up a new building here in Sao Paulo in order to serve this city of six million people. And it was then that I said, I thought to myself, we can't do this. I spoke to our chief engineer about the idea of moving all of our actors who were doing shows in Sao Paulo, of moving them to Rio and having them work in Rio and come home on weekends to Sao Paulo, whether that was even a possibility. He felt that he could handle the engineering part of it in Rio de Janeiro. We only had three very small studios in Rio to do this. So we started to move the people, the actors and other people from Sao Paulo, flying in these DC-3 aircraft, which was the only type of aircraft available in those years to Rio. We flew them there and we, we started to rent many other places in Rio to sew costumes, to do makeup, to do all the other things you have to do to produce a television show. We, we had to do, but to my two mates insisted that we build. And I thought, I walked the beach of Rio, and I said, we can't do it. It'll be the end of us. We couldn't do it. We went to the owner, Roberto Marino, and thank goodness he agreed with me that we should try to do everything from Rio as much as we can and not go into building in Sao Paulo. And the way we got the programming to Sao Paulo at the beginning was we would, we would, we, um, we would have to tape the programs and send videotape tapes to Sao Paulo when we got to Sao Paulo, 
We were all given revolvers, each one of us were given revolvers for fear that we would be shot at and sought after by any of the revolutionaries in the city. They called them revolutionaries. They, they were communists and they were trying to overthrow the military government. But the military was much stronger. They were in the process of defeating the communists or revolutionaries. The boys grabbed me and they said, Joe, you're an American. You'll be one of the first that they'll try to get. So we want you to, to hide in a hotel room, to stay in a hotel room and not come out to the station at this time. So they put me in a hotel room in the Hotel Jalagua. This hotel was above a newspaper that occupied the first eight floors of the hotel. The hotel being on the remaining five floors. So what they did was they uh, they put me in, the idea was to put, for me to stay in the hotel room for a day or so until things quieted down. The trouble was that they took the, took the elevator up to the room where I stood, but there were no stairways from that eighth floor down to the bottom so that it could be very troublesome to stay in that hotel. So I stood there for about half a day, a day, and then I left there. I said, I'm not gonna, suppose they come up the elevator and they try to get me, there's no way of me going downstairs. So, I came down with the boys and we, we continued and it was on that day, believe it or not, that the U.S. landed the astronauts on the moon on that very same day of the, the fire had taken place the day before and so we were in the control room, the make-believe control room showing the landing of the man on the moon and from our, we were sitting in the control watching that take place in a makeshift control room watching Neil Armstrong land on, that's, that's what went on that, that day. We, of course, had to be very careful of where we went during that time in Sao Paulo. We then went to Rio. The military succeeded in crushing them. The revolutionaries ran away and hid in smaller towns. So we then um, moved everybody uh, back to Rio, and we started to work in Rio. While we were trying to do everything in Rio, of all things, the American ambassador, Ambassador Elbrick, was kidnapped by the revolutionaries in Rio, the city that we were in. Not only was he kidnapped, but the German, the German uh, envoy and the Japanese envoy were also kidnapped. Immediately into Rio, flew down from the U.S. and from Great Britain, the reporters and newsmen from CBS 
NBC, ABC, and BBC. They came into my office in Rio, and they said, well, what's going on? How do we find out? I told them, we don't know. Well, the people who had the, um, who had the Ambassador Elbrick asked for 19 of their prisoners who were being held in Mexico to be freed as condition for them to free the American ambassador, to free 19 of their cohorts in Mexico. The military didn't know what to do. They hesitated, but they agreed to release the 19 prisoners from Mexico and had them flee to another country. Ambassador Elbrick was freed, and when he was freed um, in a certain section of Rio, um, he went back to the embassy, and then the next day, um, he was, the people from the networks, American networks, wanted to do an interview with him. Um, at the embassy, the, uh, which would be sent via satellite to the networks in the United States. He was going to give an interview about his kidnap, being kidnapped. He was kidnapped for about four days uh, while all this took place, the haggling. Um, so when they said they wanted to do an interview, the military of Brazil were very embarrassed. They didn't want, they didn't want the ambassador to say exactly what had gone on. So they refused to allow the American reporters to use the satellite to send any part of any interview up to the United States or to England. At that time, I had close relations with the U.S. Embassy. I, they knew I was the only American at TV Globo. So one of the men I knew was the CIA man for the government. His name was John Mowinkle. And so the embassy started to be in contact with me. And I would tell Mourinho, who would talk to the military. The military refused. And so the answer to them was, look, there are cameramen who are filming this, they will take the thing they're filming and send it up in a day so the public will know about it. A little after that. So the, the military was very hesitant. They didn't know what to do. Finally, they said to Roberto Marino, the owner of the TV Globo, he said, We'll let you, we'll let them, we'll let them go to the interview, but what they send on the satellite is up to you to decide, to TV Global, decide what they send. And, and he said no. And each time the military refused, these American reporters would come into my office and they'd say, dictator, dictator, you're not 
freedom of the press. They would be complaining to me about us, about what we were doing. And I then would talk to the CIA, man, and, you know, was to we were caught in a bind because we didn't want to take responsibility either for what they would send up on the satellite because the interview was going to be for an hour and a half interview. And you know, so what, finally the military agreed. They backed down and they agreed to let them send whatever they wanted. And they cheered, hey. Now, I must tell you that these reporters, one was stationed in Argentina and he, he was not too smart. The other one for the other network was stationed in Chile and he was a drunk. The third guy was a near, they were not sterling guys because they were overseas reporters for the networks in the States. So it was up to them to decide what they would send via satellite. It was no longer, it was up to them for freedom of the press. And it was then that I, so what did they do? They went, there was a full hour and a half interview which showed some of the good things about the reporters, some of the things that were not so good about the, the kidnappers, some good things about them, some bad thing about them. But what they did, the reporters sent the most, they sent two minutes each of the most violent parts of his kidnapping to be shown to the American and British public. Because on Walter Cronkite, for example, it only was a two, three minute report. And they sent the worst of the one and a half hour interview up to the US public. It was at that moment that my thoughts were democracy. Talk about democracy and freedom of the press. These three guys, would, they decided what the American public saw. And I said, my God, it would have been better if TV Globo decided to give a, a par, an imp, as impartial possible. But no, I thought democracy, democracy is not functioning today with what happened. And that's what happened with the Elbrick situation during this same period in 1969. Now, other things that happened in 1969 were incredible. The, the government had a state, a national telephone company that was called Embratel. And as you remember, I said that only about one in 30 people had a telephone in their homes. Telephones cost two to three thousand dollars. You would buy telephones or you would go down to a street to a public booth to make a telephone call, and there would be lines of people waiting to call home or others. You had to wait an hour to make a call, a public call. Well, the telephone company of the country, Embratel, had built microwaves throughout the big cities 
of Brazil, which enabled suddenly for calls to be made to other cities because the way it was before for somebody in Rio to call another city usually took overnight to have the call made because it was all by cable. So Embratel in that year, in September of 1969, put out this system of telephone that could go all over the country. What that did as a byproduct, it allowed television to be spread all over the country, live, for the first time, by doing that. Now, to do that, they charged us a lot of money to be able to spread. But what I put together based on that, I decided that all of our programming would come from Rio and that we would create a central thing, the Central for Engineering, the Central for Journalism, the Central for Programming, the Central for Administration would all be in Rio de Janeiro. And that in these other cities, wherever we would get affiliates, which we started to sign on, they would all follow the commands of the Central in Rio. So if we had six stations, they would all do, they would have engineers, they would have newsmen for local news, they would do things, but we centralized everything in Rio de Janeiro. And that was the creation of our first small network in 1969. And it was also in 1969 that I almost quit. At that time, then we were in Sao Paulo and we were trying to build up our audience in Sao Paulo, which was very small because our transmitter could not cover the city. So everybody couldn't get us. Well, we were working there, a group of us, and I, I insisted that we have a budget set out for every single area, a very careful budget. And they disagreed with me. And I said, well, I'm going back to Rio de Janeiro and I'm going to tell Dr. Mourinho that I'm leaving because the way we're going, we're never going to break even and we're never going to be able to have a sustainable network. Well, I went back to the hotel and that night the sales manager, the general manager, the production manager came to me. I was crying. My ex-wife was with me. I was ready to go back and quit because it was too much. I, I, they came back to my room, the three of them, and they said, Joe, we'll do what you said. Whatever you said about the budgets, we will do. And that was the beginning of change for us. However, I didn't tell you what happened in 1976. While we were working in Sao Paulo, trying to get that station up, 
We had a fire at the station in Rio de Janeiro. That didn't start, we don't think it started by the, by the terrorists or by the communists. It was a fire that started at our station there and we had to run back to Rio, this production man and I. And what we had to do was try to save the videotapes that were in the station. So the men who worked there, we, they came, there was so much smoke that you couldn't take them with the smoke. We'd go into the smoke and you had to come out and men would drink milk in order so that they could go back and, and save some of the other tapes because our whole livelihood was on those videotapes that we had there. That happened in Rio, 1976, and it was then that I convinced the owner, alongside of our studios there, was a, an apartment building being built by a builder, and he had all the apartments built. And I begged the old man, we can't do everything in that station we have. We should buy that apartment building and put our offices and main things in there and just leave the studios down in the other building. And he agreed to do that. And we bought that building and we moved all of us into this building which had apartments with toilets, sinks, and so on. We had to convert all of that into a TV headquarters of what would become our network, which is still there today in 2019 as the chief headquarters of the network. 1969, here's what happened. To continue, very important. The partners were still Time Life, and I was Time Life's employee, even though I worked with the boys, with all Brazilians. I was the only Time Life man, and Time Life was a 49% owner. But it was losing money. Time Life stopped putting money in after they'd put in about $6 million, which was a lot. So when the fire happened, I was called to New York by Time Life. By that time, they had released the guy who was the head of the broadcasting division who drank too much, and they had a new man whose name was Barry Zorthian. He was, had worked under President Lyndon Johnson and in Vietnam, he come back from Vietnam, he was a diplomat, and he was a real tough guy appointed by Time Life to take over the broadcast division. So now comes a very interesting story. He, they called me up to New York. And they said, what's going on? We have not received this new man. We never received a penny from Globo or from Brazil. You've been there for five years almost. We haven't gotten any money out of there. And I was exhausted. I said, money? I said, we're barely holding on to what we have. We can't, you know, the station is doing, you know, we can't do it. 
Zorthian said, oh yeah? I'd like to talk to Roberto Mourinho, the owner. He says, Joe, you go back there and I want you to put one word on your forehead. Money. This is the time life, man. After all we've been through down there, I'm their man. And so I said to him, yes, Sergeant. I remember saying those words, you know. So he said, I'm going to go down there as soon as I can with our finance man and two other top time life men, and I'm going to have a talk with Mourinho, the owner of Brazil. Now comes the next interesting story, because I was worn out, you know, holding my team together. And we, but at that time, we were making headway in Sao Paulo. We had taken two great actors, Tarcísio Mera and Gloria Menezes, married couple, and we had written great novella produced in Rio, which took hold of Sao Paulo audience. The other thing is, people, there were no TV manufacturers in Brazil. At first, TV sets were brought in to the country by people. Then, Sharp started to produce TV sets at the rate of TV was growing rates of number, growing 17% a year of the number of TV ray sets in the country. Because if you didn't have TV sets, you couldn't get much advertising money. So our network slowly had more revenue, but not enough to cover the costs. So Barry Zorthian came down to Brazil with his men, and we met at the Copacabana Palace Hotel. Mourinho, four guys from Time Life, Mourinho's secretary, who was in, also a translator, and I, who at this time spoke Portuguese fluently and could translate. We sat in this big suite at the Copacabana Palace, the most famous hotel in Brazil, in Rio, still there. And we had the meeting. The meeting began with Barry Zorthian saying, look, we've been out here spitting out every, all the things that were wrong. No money, inflation, and Mourinho never signed new promissory notes to account for the inflation because he signed notes to Time Life for the money they put in, but they you had to constantly adjust the notes, which he never signed. He did, it, it bothered him. And so Zorthian gave out all his bungalow against him, against Mourinho. And Mourinho was, he's a short man. He sat there listening. But after a half hour of his talking, he was finished. Mourinho, and I translated, translating more calm, not as terribly difficult as Zorthian said, which was bad. The old man Mourinho said, Joe, can I talk to you? Called me into the next ante room, 
It was a Friday afternoon. He says, I'm leaving. I'll be out on my boat for the weekend. I'll see you Monday morning. And he walked out. He said, good night, gentlemen. And he left. And Zorthian and the men sat there absolutely astounded. They didn't know what to say. They said, well, this man doesn't want to do anything. We have to talk to our lawyers here. They had, they had lawyers in Brazil. The law, I was always dealing with their lawyer in Brazil, who was very famous, whose grandfather had freed the slaves of Brazil way back. His name was Jose Nabucco. And they said, well, we have to talk to our lawyer. And Mourinho had his own. And that was the end. They left, they went back. And so then I met Mourinho and we, he said, what do we do? And I said, what do we do? We didn't know what to do. And then the thought occurred. I said, look, Dr. Mourinho, maybe you should think of buying them out, of buying them over a period of time, because I think we're going to do better. And since our audience in Sao Paulo is good and Rio audience is good, number one, maybe we'll get more advertising and we'll do better. And he said to me, Joe, I don't have the money to do that. I had spent whatever money he had spent. And I said to him, well, maybe we can pay it out in time, you know, over. So he said, well, maybe that's a good idea. And finally, he called the chairman of Time Life, Andrew High School, who really liked Mourinho, who was responsible originally for the partnership between Mourinho and Time Life, who originally wanted to go to Latin America. He asked from high school to come down to Brazil. High school was a man of about six foot six inches, born in Italy, a real international gentleman. And he liked Mourinho. He came down to Rio and they talked, they talked about paying them off. And we finally settled to buy out Time Life's interest for $3,850,000, payable $500,000 down, and the balance in an over four years in installments, with the heavy payments being in the third and fourth year is what we agreed to. And with that, Time Life asked me to go back to work for them in what became HBO in New York. And Mourinho said, Joe, I want you to stay here and run the network. But to do so, you have to become an American citizen. Uh, pardon me. You have to become a Brazilian citizen according to the Constitution of Brazil. 
According to the Brazilian Constitution, you had to be a resident for five years before you could become a citizen. And it would take a long time. When I, I decided, he said, look, I'll make it worthwhile for you, Joe. I will give you 1% of the sales give you the same as the Brazilian manager had, 1% of the sales, and I will buy you an apartment in Ipanema if you will become citizen and stay with me. And so I agreed to stay in Brazil with my family who then lived in Brazil. Now that's only the beginning. He said, Joe, do you think we can do it? And I, you know, administrator, I was the administrative guy. I know, I figured, I, I didn't know about the third year. I thought maybe the fourth year I was not sure of at all that we could pay it. I had never. I, I thought, you know, we could squeeze by, but I, but I thought, well, what the hell? This is a great experience. And I was now going to be paid at 1% of sales. Our sales were small, but as our advertising grew and the number of sets in Brazil grew, so did my salary. Then the man who was for production, I made his contract. He got 4% of the profits was his salary and we didn't have profits much to speak of. So we were making very little then. But by 1977, there's an article in the New York Times, and I can find the page for you, which shows a picture of Walter Clark, who was the manager, the the Brazilian manager of our network. He's trying to a big desk, and the title of the article was How to Lose One Million a Year Dollar Job. He was fired in June of 1977, and that's another story, which is even more interesting, just as interesting as what I've been telling you. The apartment that he gave me was worth $135,000. My salary at Time Life at that time was probably $40,000 a year, plus paying for my apartment, and so on. They paid for my rental, which was high where I lived. But I guess that you took a big risk for the company. No, I had all these guys. That I'd worked with them for five years. We were brothers together by now. And they, you know what they called me? Mickey Rooney. Because when I started, I told you, I was 42, and the average of their age was 27. They were 15 years younger than I, and the old man trusted me. Anything I've said to him before, if Joe says it's okay, it's okay. That's the way it worked, because he had complete confidence in me. So I felt, hey, this is a great adventure. 
And it turned out to be a great adventure, as I will explain to you. Minha experiência no Brasil é inédito. Na minha vida, não tinha nada maior. Mudou minha vida mais do que qualquer coisa antes. It says, my experience in Brazil was nothing like I ever had before in my life. And it changed my life completely. Now, the real story begins about TV Globo. TV Globo is today as big as CBS. Did you know them? Nobody knows them. It's not only the biggest network in Latin America, it's one of the biggest in the world. Because Brazil, did you know that Brazil in population is the fifth or sixth largest country in the world? Brazil, which had 70 million then, has 200 million. Uh -huh.